Get in, buckle up, and come for a ride with the Hoonatics. Cars, bikes, and anything else with an engine in it. Let's go. Guess what? What? This is our 10th podcast. My mate, that just fell out of the sky, didn't it? <laughs> hey, five and five. Four. Ten. Tenth podcast. Con- congratulations for not being murdered by me. <laughs> Do you know what? I'm sick and tired of carrying you through these episodes. I-, I hope this is the dawning of a new age where you step up and, you know, get off my coattails. And bring in that sort of nasally <laughs> real estate voice of yours. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Anyway, welcome back. What's been going on, my mono-browed friend? Uh, well, you know, over there in Chinland. Um, lots on the go and... Um, been working on a couple of bikes. Yeah. Uh, you may, if you have a quick look on Hoon TV, I'll put a video up of uh, I had a bit of a mess around and put some Aprilia suspension into a Honda. Oh, yeah. And it all worked and was kind of great. Is track. it a Hondilia? Uh, I called it a Blade Prilia. <laughs> <laughs> you're, but, you're a confused yeah, man. So you're you, a confused you can, man. You can check that out. It's basically a, a Honda Fireblade but with all the Aprilia suspension. That's pretty cool. That's so, pretty um, cool. Just, you know, better components. Better wheels, better brakes, that sort of stuff. Quick mention while we're on the TV. Yes. Things, congratulations. You're wearing your snap on t shirt. I've, yes. I've worn mine out now. I need a new one. Do you want me to show you my 10 mil? <laughs> you've, got, you've got one? Everyone seems to be missing this. And mine here. Yes. Is, uh, big thanks to. Oh, hang on. Hiding behind the microphone there. Yeah, very nice. Iconic motorbikes. Big shout out to uh, Adam. And the boys over there in LA yeah. well, and the whole team uh, put some videos up on Hoon TV of that as well. Uh, just an awesome place if you're into 90s motorbikes. They've got some of the coolest stuff and just constantly got amazingly rare bikes coming through the doors there. One including the Honda NR750. They just put up a video the other day. Oh, is that the unboxing? Unboxing a zero miles NR750. They're going for upwards of 160,000 US. Wow. Wow. So God knows what that one's worth. Uh, Adam, out of sheer lunacy, let me take one for a ride while I was there. Um, no, obviously trust me to take for a ride. So, um, yeah, I got to ride. Well, if we're ever over there, you can introduce me. How's that sound? I've, I'd be keen. I'm not a motorbike guy, but Absolutely, I'll go and have a look. but right? I will tell Adam not to let you yeah. ride anything. No, 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 yeah. just get a sidecar. I'll go in the sidecar. That's fine. Um, what have you been up to? What's been going on? Uh, well, yeah, pretty much that. Um, just working on the drag car, working on the Land Cruiser, um, just doing normal work stuff yeah, as right. well. But um, speaking of the drag car, it is uh, done. Oh, wow. Just needs a tune in it. Awesome. And, um, yeah. I have been painting the Swift, Tom Swift. Um, I've been working very feverishly, very fast on the Jeep. Um, Uncle Buck, uh, we've got Beta Birdwood coming up. It's going to be making its debut run there. Got lots of bits, just little stuff like, you know, the, the rear drums have gone out around, so it's getting a pulsation through the back. We've got to get the machine. Trans is getting served. Now it's got a rocker cover leak. I've got to fix that. Is it, it all- going to be smoky like Uncle Buck's car? You remember when it'd pull up <laughs> and there'd just be this cloud of smoke <laughs> go past it? Do you remember what the girl's boyfriend's name was in that movie? No. Bug. <laughs> Great movie. No, it's not going to be like that, but it is proving to be a very cool truck and very hard with some vehicles, as you know, that you encounter them in your life, whether you own them or drive them. You come across a vehicle, you kind of go, "This, I wear this well. I enjoy this. You know, whatever time of your life, it could be all sorts of motorbikes or cars. It's just a vehicle that's inoffensive and fun. The car is like... um it's like you wearing like the, you know, your geology teacher at school yeah. that had like the, the tan coloured jacket with the- Yeah, but that's cool now. elbow patches on That it. gets the chicks, mate. Um, we'll have to put a picture of it up in this podcast so people see what we're talking about. Green, Parkway green, only a couple of them in Australia, light brown interior, just quintessential, you know, 80s goo is a good way of describing it. Is that right? Should we get on with it? We should. So I think um, we'll get our guest in yep. <clears throat> while I cough my guts up. Yep. And, um, yeah, we'll be uh, talking a little bit more about car stuff because our guest is probably about 10,000 times the car nerd we are. Go! A Snap-on franchise is a tool to your freedom and we currently have franchise opportunities available across Australia. Snap-on have the best brands in the industry a supportive network with exclusive training, as well as financing options to get you on the road. 
Are you ready to drive your own success? Visit snaponfranchises.com.au or call 1 800 762 766 for more information. All righty, we're back. And uh, yeah, as always, a big thanks to uh, Snap On, yeah. our sponsor for the podcast. Wouldn't be here without their help. And um, as you come into announcing our new guest, yeah. he is actually a Snap On tragic as well. So it's great. I've been working oh. on my car at his workshop, pilfering through his toolbox all the Snap On stuff because he's got more Snap On tools than I do. Yeah. And but being the respectful tool user I am, everything goes back where it came out. So well, what you, told, you get told off anyway. Hang on. Are you saying that you've been touching his tools? Yes. You're a weird individual. Ladies and gentlemen, our next guest. Well, before I tell you who this guy is, I'm going to tell you where I first met this guy. We uh, have the music that takes us back to the early 1990s. And a certain Mr. Chandler was telling us off because I think we were throwing Vegemite scrolls at each other upstairs in the, um, in the senior school department at Ranella East High School. And a gentleman who had a lot more hair then on top of his head, not on the end of his chin, was this guy, Jason Way. Welcome, mate. Welcome. G'day, guys. How are we all? Those were the days, weren't they? They were. Thank God we're not young anymore. Pseudo Echo. Dun, 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 dun. All that sort of great music, wasn't was it? Was Jason as <coughs> mental back then as he is now? Do you remember Mr. McLeod? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> who was the guy that put his knee on the back of that guy's head at school and the teacher? Oh, anyway, I don't like, recall that. But- it's probably yeah. not a good thing to Do you remember the name to. of the PE teacher? Mr. John. Mr. John Cock? <laughs> remember, there's a movie about that with Stifler in it, Mr. Woodcock. Mr. Woodcock. No, this yeah. guy was called Mr. John Cock. It was Mr. John Cock. Yeah, and Mrs. Alston, and she never shaved and stuff. Like, anyway, we go on, we go on. Jason Way, Tough Mounts Muscle Garage, owns and operates an emerging Australian modified part supply business, building bespoke components. Offering vehicle repair services, modification services, keen drag race, a family man, all-round nice guy, and possibly breaker of his wife's dreams by selling a Volkswagen. Did I sum that up correctly? Close. <laughs> Welcome, mate. Welcome to Thank the Hunatics. Thank you very much for having me. Well, it's, uh, it's been uh, an interesting ride from you from day one. We, we go back a long way. We do. We go back a long way, and it's, and it's kind of an unfair relationship. But the cool thing is, you know, when you're at high school, Mark, you can look at all the guys you went to high school and the girls, and you can count on less than two or three fingers the real, genuine, bona fide car enthusiasts, right? And and we were lucky from our school; we had quite a few. We and did. one of them is Adam Van der Linden, yes, who runs the restoration shop down south of Adelaide. Yep, Southern Classics. And and it's kind of cool because Renella East, we had some gearheads, didn't we? Yeah, we did. You know, we did. It was the area. Yeah, yeah. Well, Woodland Car Park. <laughs> <laughs> Do you ever go to the Cabbage Patch where they've got the Southern Expressway now and do donuts over yeah, the ground? Yeah, see. Down Longstar Highway for a quick cruise down to the Bay Car Park. Oh, well, that's too far. We couldn't afford to go that way. Yeah. We're from Southern <laughs> Suburbs, mate. The 722 went down that it way, did, though, yeah. so we're okay. <laughs> well, let's, let's talk about you, mate. Let's talk about your backstory and kick things off because you're a car guy. You obviously have a really cool business with Tough Mounds. Um, but before we get to where you are right now, let's rewind the tape back to maybe around that high school days. Mm-hmm. And what was the start of your car journey? How did it all kick off? Uh, my family's been into cars forever. So dad was a car salesman. He started Adelaide Special Vehicles back in, oh, God, pretty mid, mid-80s, so 85, 86. Um, he used to work from home at that point, buy Commodores from the government, do Brock body kits to them, sell them on, so on and so forth. What was, when was that? What, was, what sort of year was that, circa? Oh, uh, VL. Wow, it was yeah, so late VKs, VLs. Um, used to buy the the VK ex police cars in the baby blue. HDT HSV changeover period. Yes. Yep. yep. And so All he would up. he was ASV, wasn't he? That's correct. Adelaide Special Vehicles. That would have been huge. It was interesting times. Absolutely, it was sort of the start of. I mean, Brock had been going for a while, but it was really the start of the Australian factory modified aftermarket style cars. So you had the factory HCT stuff and then the aftermarket was sort you of You would have seen some in. good stuff come through your drive through Ridiculous, yeah. And we're talking high school. So we're talking, what, Mark, uh, 16, 17 years old? Yeah, be about that. Yeah? Yep. And so and so, what did that mean for you, like, with first cars and stuff like that? What was that? What, 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 what was your first car? My first car was an XC Falcon 4.1 Auto. Cool. Boring. What colour? Uh, like, like surf mist green. It was horrid. Wow. It was horrible. But hang on, hang on. <coughs> as, a, as a first car, though, like looking back now, 
That's oh, kind of cool. Yeah. Cool car. Yeah, Absolutely. You ready for the next question? So what did you do to it? Repainted it and sold it. <laughs> Like I did not have my driver's license. I sold it's it. Like the fish I drove is there. It. You just got to reel it in. You know what I mean? Like you modified it, didn't you? Oh, I painted it because the paint was staff. What you? What colour did you go? Same colour. Yeah. So just a factory respray, and literally sold it. I never drove the car. I didn't have my license. Right. So I reversed it down the driveway, back up the top, and it was gone. What? What replaced it? A VH six cylinder Commodore manual. Yeah. And that was. The next one, had that one for a while. Can we have a side adjunct here? And I know you don't like me going off on tangents, but too bad. Sit there and just look weird. I'm getting okay. into it. Do you remember at high school Hayden's yes. car? Yes, Commodore. Do you remember, what was it? Do you remember? Was it a VL? No, it was VH. Was it a VH? VH had VK, I reckon, and VK, sort of like front bars, rear bars. Black? Black, V8. And it was his high school car. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you hate him as much as I hated him? Because well, he had that car. hate, but there was a fair bit of like- Resentment. Resentment, yeah. Yeah. He bastard. All of those he, cars. He could afford fuel down at Glenelg. Do you remember David Capri, that yes. beat up Capri? Yep. And and the Volkswagen that had something, what was it, Fubar on the back of it or some- I don't remember that. No, one. Yuck Fu it had written on the back of it. And then there was that black Commodore and, and Hayden walked out, popped in, <laughs> drove the ski bike. We were all sitting there going, oh. Bastard. They were formative years, weren't they? They were good. They were good. So let's move on to um, post-high school cars and, 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 and that period of time. What happened with you? So I bought and sold a few cars for a while, um, which was good for putting money in the bank. Then um, – He obviously I, knows the formula. That we yeah. know. <laughs> well, it was – I, I was smart. The reverse for all the I was, rest of us. Yeah, I was smart at the start. Then I started modifying. Yeah. And then it all turned to, well, no, it's okay. It's all good now. <laughs> you, you know, you know, it's funny you say that, right, because I remember a certain car that he had, and he'll know the minute I talk about it, and he had this before anybody had it, and, and I know- And so the one, two, one bubble. No, I know he made money on it. You ready? Do you remember the Tirana A9X hatch? Yeah. That was the first car I built. All right. That's it. Podcast over. <laughs> That was crazy. That that had that was a cool car. That that had it, it, and it was through the bonnet end of the scoop. I remember that. Yep, I remember it was that a cool car. car. So that was my first modifying of a car. It was a full build. It was good. We drove it for a while and then developed a rattle. Mm. Someone else offered me lots of money for it, so on it went. You drove past me once, and I was on my BMX, and you were driving that <laughs> because that's what I was riding. You were in that. And I remember thinking my hatred for Hayden has now changed to Jason Way. Oh, the, last, <laughs> the last thing he remembers is Jason leaning out the window with a broom handle through your front spokes. <laughs> One yeah. metre, mate. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, on from that period of time, obviously your father had a big influence and, 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 and did you know guide you in those early days with that sort of stuff. He, he changed his direction, but you continued, didn't you? Yeah, so <clears throat> throughout the years, Dad was obviously buying and selling and building cars. Um, I I enjoyed that side of things. I worked with Dad for quite a few years until he um, sold the business and retired. The new owners of the business, I didn't like the way that they went about business, so I then started my own company up, which was more doing what I enjoyed, which was modifying and not just supplying a, a piece. It was building a car and making it what people wanted. And that was a good business for, for quite a few years. Um, I got out of it because I got sick of the industry. Yep. And then... Um, Still kept building cars. But your attention to detail and your desire to build cars took you to places like Summit Ads. Oh, for sure, yeah. That's and, right. and, you, and, and and one of the cars, you've got a number of different cars we could talk about, but I'm going to talk about one of the unorthodox ones, which was the green ute. Yeah. So so just give us a little quick overview of what that ute was and what you did. So the green ute um, was essentially my first build under my new business. So that was a uh, HX ute. It had a 350 Chevy in it, big tubs and all that sort of stuff. It was single colour, a nice, clean sort of car. Did a few shows locally with it, did well, and then I put a supercharger on it and repainted it and made it stupid. So engine was probably a little bit taller than the roof and made lots of power and we put bigger wheels on it and made it tough. And was that your first street machine feature car? Yes. I think it was. because yes. It was be first first feature and first cover. Because um, Four Eyes over here is about to land Hang his- on. Yeah, but did we talk about him differently? Yeah, I was just oh, going right. to say, hang on, there's this a lot is, of glasses in here. Yeah. This is the JJ side, that's the dynamite oh, okay, side, okay? Cool. okay? Uh, so <laughs> he's he's about to head towards um, Street Machine fame as well yes. with his ute. Yes. And, and we were talking about that. And and the how did that feel to get that feature and get the call to say we want a feature? How did that feel to you in the business? Oh, it was, it was it, you know, it's really good. It's 
confidence inspiring. It know it makes you feel that you know you've actually done something right and be accepted. And um, someone like Street Machine in those days was a was a huge achievement because you know it was hard to get on the cover. It was hard to get in the magazine. Now, um, it's I won't say it's easier, but with more cars being built, there's a lot of the same yes. stuff being built. And that's really hard to get then into magazines because I've just built a Commodore, I've slapped some wheels on it, put an LS into it, on a f- magazine feature. Yeah, right. Well, street Commodores are gone now, so you can't do that. So now it's Street Machine, it's only really the quality stuff that can get picked up. From from the Ute build and from the reputation of the Ute build, things, I'm just going to holistically look at it, things took off. Mm-hmm. Didn't it? Yeah, it absolutely helped, Be- definitely. You bumped into guys like Chubby and things like that yep. in the show scene and then suddenly, you know, the, the, it was I think it was the Air Hammer product. Yeah, Air Hammer. Yeah, that was sort of at the end of my SVE days, yep. the specialised vehicle days. And that was sort of the introduction of you to single product production, wasn't Correct. it? Correct, yep. And which has led you to where now? Well, it's led us to Tough Mounts now. So sort of the end of the SVE days, um, obviously doing the body kits and custom cars. We were building a... A VK Commodore for myself, um, which was a, a bit of a long build. It took too long to build. It was, at the time, it was groundbreaking with big 22-inch wheels and tubs. And this was probably 05, 06. And I developed a, an engine mount. So I had a, a local fabricator make an engine mount for me, which was really cool. He made it, looked good, worked well. Another bloke comes in, hey, that's that's cool. Make me one. So I made him one. Then made another five sets and then <laughs> all of a sudden... You're getting phone calls from people saying, oh, do you do it for this and do you do it for that? And no, no, no. And in the end, I sort of thought that, you know, maybe there's a market there. And 10 years later, here we are. There is a market. There is a market and it's a it's a big market out there. Tough tough Mounts is the four-mount vehicle mounting, engine mounting system mm-hmm. in, in the aftermarket. The foremost, not the four-mount. Four-mount. Four-mount, foremost. <laughs> Rear-mounted manufacturer of engine mounts in Australia. I mean, you've modified car. You want to put something into something. Correct. It's the first thing on your mind is how do I do it? Yeah. Most people are now looking at your site. Is there a kit? You know, that's right. About uh, twenty-eight thousand kits in Jason's range now to put barras into anything. <laughs> it's getting close. <laughs> well, you can ask the barra questions. What's the weirdest kit, like conversion kit, you've got? What into what? Well, currently, it'd probably be LS into Sigma. That's not that weird. No. That's weird enough. You need Hasn't something weird before. in your in your product range. No, actually, this is this is opening the doors for Jason <laughs> <laughs> Briggs and Stratton range for go karts. You could, yeah, that'd be pretty cool because you you know realistically that would the go kart market. Would be- My question <laughs> is the the rise of of different types of engines have fueled your business success. Correct, right? There's no doubt the LS motor has been a cornerstone you know, of, of, of your business. But the rise of the popularity of the Barra motor, mm-hmm. particularly recently, almost because they've stopped making them, ha- has seen a, a just a, a quantum leap in desire of, of, of products to put yep. them into anything. Yep. Tell us a little bit about that and how that it's influenced your business. So, look, the Barra, I mean, the LS is the LS. Everyone knows what it is. It's a good, great bang for your buck motor. The Barra is the Ford version of that. It is... It's a really good engine. They work really well with a little amount of mods, with turbos at least. Um, they can smash a lot of crap. Um, the hardest part with the Barrett is trying to fit them into vehicles because they're such a big engine. Um, unless you can just about fit into anything. So the Barra into, you know, we're doing a US Fox body Mustang, as a lot of people know, is, is fantastic. So that market over in the States is becoming insane. They've just got wind of it and they're, really starting to, to move forward on that, so which I, is cool. I've always had this thought process in my mind because the Barra is, outside of Australia, exotic, mm-hmm. right? It's extremely exotic. You know, obviously the Barra's got a lot of competition from things like 2Js and RBs and bits and pieces, but I- is it that good? It is. It is. It and is that know, good. The, the thing is that it's, <clears throat> it's almost a bit of a weird exclusivity thing with the Barra now because being an Aussie engine, it was only here and New Zealand, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. So Yep. Now overseas, the guys in America are like just getting super excited about it. I mean, tech-wise, they're not really that much better than the other engines. They're just one thing they got going for them is big capacity. Big capacity, that's right. But um, I think, it, yeah, it's that, um, you know, these Mustangs and all that, everyone's getting excited because it's something different. Yeah. You well, like, you know, you'll end up with something that somebody else hasn't got, which yeah. is hard to do in America when there's like 300, 000, uh, 300 million people, you know. Like, that's right. 
You know, it's funny because he, it harks back to that one movie called The Fast and the Furious and that, that, that super rocks up on the back of the, um, the truck. We, and We still haven't invented 15-speed gearboxes. Yeah, yet, but and Jesse jumps up and lifts it up and goes, 2JZ, right? It was the reputation of the engine in that wrecked car that just changed everything. Right, and he knew oh, this is, we just do this, and this is going to deliver. Yeah, such is the case with a barra, isn't it? It is. You yeah, know, it is. Uh, but but on that, you know, you're you're a, a staunch South Australian. Your family's here. Your life's mm-hmm. here. The rise of the Australian product, the aftermarket product, to a truly global stage has never been more applicable with the rise of the barra motor because it's like it's our motor, it's our stuff. Away we go. Yep. How, how are you finding the acceptance of the Australian aftermarket product, such as an engine mount, versus the rest of the world? Um, I think it's, it's all right. Um, we, as I said, I was over in America just recently for doing Drag Week. We were there supporting a, an American Mustang that was built by Aussies, essentially, using yep. all of our products. And the, the response from a lot of people of the quality of the product and how it fitted and what the car did over the week um, was was pretty all unparalleled. It, it's an interesting market. I don't think we'll take them on head to head. I just think we'll have a nice little bespoke one over there. Yep. Our prices are more expensive than what theirs are, but with well, the Aussie dollar at the, the moment, Aussie dollar, <laughs> Aussie dollar is very helpful. Yeah. Um. So that's helping drive a lot of that at the moment. Making Australia affordable again. Well, um, <laughs> <laughs> looking at production numbers, and obviously with the massive US interest in barras and. Globally, I mean, there's a bloke over in Sweden that's got the Volvo with yes, the bar in it. yep. <laughs> uh, and, yeah, there's interest coming from everywhere for these engines, this amazing, you know, 2J killer. This amazing new engine that's quite old. That's basically just an old EA single cam engine with a twin cam head on it. Production-wise, they, like however many Falcons they made, and there was like hundreds of thousands of them, so it's not like we're going to run out of barrows in a hurry. But compared Oh, to, be but, very careful what you say there. But compared to like LSs, which... They probably made a hundred thousand times more LSs than they have yeah. barrows. Yep. Um, it's going to get to the point where these things are starting to get ridiculously expensive because we're going to run thin on them. And even the fact that a non-turbo, crappy base model barra is only a few modified parts away from being a thousand yeah. horsepower. Yeah, correct. You know, weapon. Yep. Um, yeah, the the people are going to be. Selling old taxis and, and that, engines and stuff that like that. Adjunct us way to Mark Box's top tips. Kids, buy a barra and put it in the shed. Yeah. Is that what it is? Next time you, At least you one. pull it, <laughs> you make sure you're leaving your pull it with a barra in your in your wheel barra. So you know those fifty dollar wrecking days, like carry whatever you can carry? Get a barra. Or, or you pull it and have got their list of like their rough list of what parts cost and it's yeah. like, you know, doors, windows, this engines. Barra. Barra. And that's an extra zero on the end of it because, yeah. But, you know, you go and get a, a QT-coded 308 block. What's yep. what's the block worth? They're worth gold now. 308 gold. blocks are worth stupid money. We recently sold a, a good five litre out of a running car. Yeah. And it sold very, very quickly for what I thought was a lot of money. Everyone else thought it was fair price. I'm just going... We and it was almost it was almost overnight, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I could almost say, go back eighteen months. You, I mean, even a, even a, a running two fifty three with a trimatic, someone got a thousand bucks, and you're like, look at them and go, sorry, yeah. pardon. Mm. Well, you the know? other thing is too is that like now that Ford have shut down and wherever the hell the original castings for the the sand castings were for the block and the head, if somebody managed to buy them or get them or do whatever. Someone with some deep pockets and passion for barrow engines going to start reproducing they them? They could, or? but that's when they'll start. Someone will start doing a billet block for it. Yeah, and that's, that's head, probably the, the next. Yeah. And yeah. I think from memory, um, someone, uh, an engine builder for them, said the blocks are pretty good if you get a good one. That's right. Uh, the the head's probably the, the more important the thing point. to do the aftermarket part for. Yeah, so, that's right. Yeah. Well, well we, go, we go back and rewind the tape a little bit to drag week. You've just come back 10 days on the road. Is it as good as what people say? It, it, actually, I'm just going to basically, me and Jason are going to sit back now and get comfortable. Just tell us all about Drag Week from the minute you left. Oh, let me let me walk him in. Is yeah. it as good Adelaide as what Airport people going say? Going down the ramp. It is. Yeah. So it's a bloody long way over there. It's hard work. So yeah. long flight, you get there. That's without a car. That's without a car. Like sitting in a plane next to someone else that you don't know in a plane. It's not fun. Yeah. Not fun. You land straight into a car. We went straight to EV West, which is electric vehicle 
yep. like place over in um, in San Diego. Kelly, yep. Uh, really cool, actually, checking that stuff out and seeing the retrofitted gear. But you know, that's another story. Next day, we flew over to Washington DC because Drag Week was over on the the East Coast of America this time. Next day, get down the track, and I haven't seen any American tracks like this before, and it was just big and beautiful and clean, and you can't compare it to anything we have over here. It's well sorted, well, re- you know, really very nice. First day, it literally pissed down with rain, and we're all going. Oh. First day out's a, a washout, but it stopped raining at about eleven thirty, and then like thirty people get out on the racetrack and dry it off, and sort of forty five minutes they're ready to race. Yeah, it's just just amazing. <laughs> If it rained that much here, it'd be the meeting would be cool. Pull the pin. Yeah, it'd be all over. Pull the pin. First cars go out and it's it's pretty amazing. You see some really fast stuff. Street but driven stuff. These are all street driven cars. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of race cars. Yeah. Like series series race cars, but hidden. They're street driven. So they put lights on them and mirrors and they drive them. So they're very thinly veiled street cars. Isn't that part of the American dream is to take something that is not realistically purposeable? purposeful and do something like that. Absolutely, it. yeah. Now, the laws over there, what they can drive in the streets, so different to what Your we can drive Your mind must have been going, oh, I only lived how, here. How could you do this? How could you do that? How could you get away with that back home? But we can't. So we've yeah. still got to have more street cars than what those guys have got. So they are a lot further advanced in the, the times that they're running, but the tracks that they have, they're far better prepared. They're, they're sorted out. They've got guys that are just on it. If, they, if a car does this, they go, Oh, I know what that is. It's such, 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 and such, and they go fix it. It's just they know what they're doing, mm. um, and that really helps the the fast, fast cars. Yeah, right. So here on Drag Challenge Australia, we see a lot of seven second cars, which are our fastest. Over there, six seconds are their fastest, and now this year they actually the fastest cars now five ninety nine bumped into the fives. That's just it's insane. Well, we've, we've, Australia's always been. <laughs> You know, and I'm, I'm, I'm happy to say it, I'm an Aussie. We've always been behind the Americans w- within a lot of respect in regards to the car side of things. But what we have that they don't have is we are the underdogs, we're the fighters, we are instigators, we're problem solvers, we don't lay down. Correct. And there was a certain orange Chevelle with two turbos hanging out the bonnet, you know, and stuff like that. Yep. And that's the epitome of the Australian spirit. We're unrelenting on that side of Correct. things. Correct, yep. Did Drag Week give you a desire to go and do it yourself with a car? I am tempted to do Drag Week America. Has it's, it created an itch? Oh, it, the itch was there before because it's one of those things you can do it in Australia and it's it's not easy. What would you go with? I don't know. And that's that's the problem. After checking the event out, there are... I know someone's got a race car for sale. <laughs> Thinly veiled. <laughs> Thinly veiled. <laughs> It's only a few door trims away. That would that would work. That car would work. Oh, the car would work over there, hundred percent, because it's unique. Yeah. And that's the hardest part of taking something over there. It needs to be different to stand out. Yeah. Because uh, there's just so like there was three hundred and sixty cars about. Wow. This year, how many finished? I don't know. I haven't heard the number. Because there's, um, there's an attrition rate. There is. Yeah, I reckon it still would have been high two hundreds that finished. There was still a lot. That's of cars. mental, isn't that's it? Awesome. Yeah. yeah. That is mental, isn't it? I mean, uh, I'm I'm keen to actually just hear about your experience. I mean, you know, obviously we heard about the the flight over and that sort of thing. Like, so just give us a sort of recap of the event for you. I mean, uh, uh, how many hours a day you spent traveling versus that, and and. And feel some of the people you met and some of the cars, because I mean, obviously, we're going to pinch the photos out of your phone. Because <laughs> I asked Jason, I'm like, did you take a few photos? And he goes, oh, I think I took about two and a half thousand photos. <laughs> so you, you just see Jason's walking around with like so cameras, like, just constantly well. so filming. <laughs> Jason was actually half watching the event and half walking half. around, going, "Anyone got an iPhone charger?" <laughs> <laughs> the, the cars were killer. Yeah. Um, all the, the fast stuff is just insane. Um, the way they build them is really good. Then you've got the, the street stuff, which isn't. It's Cobbled together. Yeah, yeah. It's, but that's cool. That's, which is a badge of honour. Yeah, it is. That's right. You know, So they, they build the car at home and they do the event and if they can make it to the wards end, it's, it's, a, you know, it's a treat for them and it's something that they've tried to do and they, more power to them. Um, we see it here in Australia as well where guys don't have a lot of money. They're not trying to... Be number one. They're just trying to finish the event, and and it's it's their pride, and it's what they want to do. It's their dream, so it's good for that. But car wise is just insane. Um, the tracks are really good. We we sort of there just after eight o'clock most mornings, and twelve thirty one o'clock we were on the road heading wow. towards 
the next three hundred cars through in that time. That's crazy, and it, it is it's good. So they've, they've got all the class cars, which are the, generally the fastest sort of cars, and then they've got half the fields what they call street machine eliminator. So it's more street machine stuff. So they run ten second to fifteen plus seconds. Yeah. Um, so they get about a three hour window. The class cars get a two hour window. Yeah. You can do as many runs as you can in that time, but generally it's one, maybe two. Yeah. Then they open the field up to the street machine guys. And then at the end of that, um, they allow anyone to just get in lane and go for it. So the track's open from about 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. And that's where you have to run. And then after that, you're on the road. Is this your quite. first one? In America, yes. Yeah. yeah. And, and was it everything you accept, expected it to be? Yeah. 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 Um, having that, that car run a five was something I hadn't expected. Yeah. And a, a welcome. Yeah. It was welcome because that was just. Well, it's crazy. It's it's, it's a record breaking. Car, it's great. car shows and comedy, mate. That's all about timing. <laughs> well, that's it? right. Boom, boom. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it is. Now, well, let's let, <coughs> let's talk about the fast car, right? The fast car that ran the, the five ninety nine. That that's an incredible vehicle. Mm-hmm. Did you get close to them at all? And close to the car? Did you get some discussion, some talk time, anything? Like really that? hard guys to talk to because they are so on point, focused on and you know content on aimed at what they're doing. Yeah, their their routine is just insane. So they're at the track before it opens, and they're starting to let the car cool down, and they push it to the pits, and then they start pulling rocker covers off and rocker gear off, and checking springs and making sure the springs are right and the valves are closing properly because everything is so concise and precise. It has to be perfect. If it's not perfect, they'll change it. That particular car moves in a circle of about three or four vehicles that are very similar in performance Mm -hmm. and and they all know each other and they all tend to gravitate towards each other. And if one drops out and one does a great time, normally the person who dropped out comes back with gusto the next year. Correct. Because there's a lot of ego in those circles. Did you find there was like, we we, we go to somewhere like Summonats where you've competed at the top level. Yep. And then you go to Drag Week. Did you get that aura of ego in there? No. No? No, that was interesting. Um, at that sort of level, you really, I expected it. Um, the guys that run the Camaro, um, Morris and um, Bailey, very focused on what they wanted. That's This is where we're going, this is what we're doing. So they, more they, discipline they, than ego. Absolutely. Yeah, they were just, this is what we're doing. And no one sort of could really interrupt them. That's refreshing, isn't it, Mark? Uh, I've known of Steve Morris for a while. Like He's a one of the US's sort of foremost V8 engine builders and got a big background with like pro charges and stuff mm-hmm. like that. So for them, that's work. Like yeah. they're they're obviously passionate about having fun at drag week and that, but they're they're proving race on Sunday, that's right. race on yeah. Sunday, sell on Monday. Yeah, yeah, and that's the thing. He'll come away from this event with people ringing him, going, "I want that." Yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah. When he was his second to last run on the last day. They ran a, a six oh one something, and he walked away upset, not upset, but not happy. Yeah, and like that was the fastest time the car had done. It was the fastest time of the week. It wasn't happy. That obviously he wanted it, to find. That obviously set it to kill. Yeah. And went, you know what? Let's just let's just pop it and push it hard. I I, I asked that question before about that other group because you cannot sit here and tell me that Jeff Lutz is sitting there going, "Ah, oh, that's fine. Let him have it." A benchmark's now been set. A new goal's been set for everyone. Next year they'll be running. You know, low sixes will be the norm, and high fives will be the go. Mm-hmm. I think if um, Bailey had another run, another chance to have another pass on Friday, I reckon they would have turned it up more and gone for. 590s, 580s, yeah. and giving it a go because yeah. said it ran 250 mile an hour. It's just over 400 kilometers an hour. It over cut, 400 cut meters. Me. It's like part of me, like I, I'm super impressed, and it's so cool what they did. I mean, I look at it and go, that just wouldn't happen in Australia because it's 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 a street car. Yeah, but you know, like what they did is so cool. And I mean, um, what I wanted to talk about was um, obviously going to the event. I had a look at a, a story that that uh, Street Machine did. Chris Thorogood was over there shooting. He's he a really was. cool dude. Yeah, uh, Matt Rickey, who now lives over there, they did a really cool story about um, their top uh, eleven cars mm-hmm. from the event. And just scrolling through that and going, it's really mm. nice to see that there's still a, a solid mix of old school, new school. Yeah. Yeah, you got one car with sort of big stacks hanging out the bonnet with them. Um, sorry, out the hood. <laughs> you know, old school style. And then next minute you've got a, a Camaro with a twin turbo LS in it. So yeah. you've got like a real mix of high, high, uh, high tech and low tech. Exactly. And that's yeah. what's really good about the, the, the event. It's just so broad. Mm. It's not just, okay, we've all got LSs or we've only got a few barrows. It's just, it's just across the board. There were manual cars running eight-second passes. 
It's mm. just it's unheard of. You know, well, it's cool. I mean, um, in in my in the photos there, like I've just brought the story back up again. But one of the cool ones um, was the the guy from New Jersey with the fifty seven channel Chev panel van. Yes. Yeah, like a bit of a rat rod thing, but it had like a four ninety six big block in it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to drop a name here. Don't mind doing it. Happy to do it. Um, I had a conversation in the last couple of days with a guy called Mike Finnegan, mm-hmm. and I've talked to him a couple of times out of, out of Roadkill fame, just on different stuff over the years and stuff like that. But I had a conversation with him just only within the last 24 hours, and I sent a message saying, you know, congratulations, you ran 8.52 in a street gasser. Mm-hmm. In a Leaf Spring Street gasser. Okay. Now, I'm not going to compare his 55 to my 82 Jeep Cherokee, but I, I will. Not. I've driven my Cherokee on the on the street with Leaf Springs, and I'm like going, so I think I want to go that way, <laughs> right? I'm driving that way. This guy did 852 and drove all those Ks. And it's manual too. And it's blown Hemi. It, you, I, I, I'm, I'm so excited to be a part of the modified car scene at the moment. And I, and I think you would probably agree with me. It's a, just a great time to be involved, isn't it? It is. People are just doing different stuff and they're trying stuff that the old tried, tested, true isn't good enough anymore. Yeah. Oh, I've got a Chevron, I want a Turbo 400 and a one a nine inch. Yeah. Mm. Cool. Boring. But 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 if if it is your thing, then that's cool. 100%. Totally. And then he, then he comes back the next day and goes, oh, yeah, look, it's got a fuel-injected carburetor on it and it's got twin T4s down there in the boot. And you kind of go, yeah, well, I, wow. See that coming awesome. Yeah, that's right. It's an exciting time. Well, going back to your business and being an exciting time, what's what's the future for you? Where, where's the direction? Where are you seeing things starting to head? Or are you just you're just happy with where it is at the moment? Happy with where it is. It's continually growing. The the scope for for modifying cars and where it's going to end is I, I can't tell you. Yep. It's currently, the the four wheel drive scene, as Mark knows, is is growing drastically. Ellis's and Barrett conversions into Land Cruisers and Patrols and Hiluxes is just infinitely growing. We all need tow rigs. Well, we do. <laughs> <laughs> On the back end of that, what about what about the uh, harking back to the show car scene? Have you left that behind? Oh, look, I haven't left it. Um, I still like it, but the level to what you have to do to be at the level to be up there is out of the reach of most people. Mm. So because of that, I've just gone not interested. I take you to an adjunct now and, and, and deliberately do so. We're very similar ages, you and I. We're happily Surely embracing. You're older. We're happy. You'd think so, but look at you know, oil of Olay. Um, <laughs> we happily embrace middle age life. And, and we look back on those retrospective days of analog and we enjoy that. And, and never more so, Mark, and this is going to be a great thing to include in this podcast visually. You restored recently a Charger yes. in South Australia that was a very unique vehicle. Just just talk us through what that was. So a lot of South Australians know of Clem Smith, who was a, a car dealer and owner of Malala, and a, a lot of really cool stuff here in, in South Australia, a big motorsport identity. He passed away a few years ago. Um, his family sold off all of his assets. And uh, another local sports sedan enthusiast, Simon, purchased the car and um, asked us to sort of give it a, a restoration before the Malala all-historic race at the start of the year. Um, so we had about seven weeks where we had to basically pull the car apart. Seven weeks? Seven weeks. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> Only take it to Clem's favourite event. And Anyway, but so seven weeks, a so full respray. Mechanical was done. It just needed a few tidying up points. Um, custom do the body, remake a front spoiler, Moulds, jigs, everything else, wing. It's a big job yeah. in sort of seven weeks. And he managed to do it, managed to pull it off. And it was, yeah, it's a really cool car. Certainly okay. something that I think is, oh, it's probably one of my favourite builds in a long time because it's mm. just happened so quickly and the finished product was awesome and the, the response we got from the fans. He, think, got, he got to film it, didn't he? He did. Well, and yeah. the thing for me too was that you didn't just rebuild it, you Took it back to a period where yeah. it was its coolest as well. Exactly, so you pumped yeah. the guards back to what it was <coughs> and all that. Those but, wheels. But the best thing Those for wheels. me was, like, the car is a finished product. We, oh, I was there, we were filming, putting the stickers on it and stuff like that. And, you know, Jason had all the stickers done back to when it was a, a certain era. But seeing the finished products, like, oh, this is so cool. Like, you know, charges <laughs> are cool regardless of the fact, but it's so cool. But then to put, you know, this much icing on the cake on top of it was to hear the thing yeah. at the track. Oh. And like that gearbox, the engine sound, everything—it just was just this awesome package. And 
like Clem Smith to a lot of people was this like old bloke that owned a racetrack. But now, like seeing that and hearing the car and going, Clem built that. He's a cool dude. Mm. Guys, yeah, totally. I, I'm going to quickly take one of my many adjuncts and I'm going to just blow your minds and How many do you have on this? No, no, you're ready for this? You, oh, okay. You're going to actually genuinely like it's this. It's like his personality. Yeah. Well, my, <laughs> my father has no interest in cars at all, none whatsoever. But he told me a story recently of Clem Smith and I just sat there enthralled. Did you know that there used to be a thing called mud races at Paris Creek where they have the cows and they used to go through this track and all that sort of stuff and they'd get bogged? And we're talking back in the 70s, Something like that, right? And they'd all get bogged. And every now and again, the track would be chocked up with cars and they'd have to drag them out. And the crowd would start chanting, bring out Clem Smith. My ears pricked up. I'd yeah, never wow. heard this. So apparently the story goes that Clem Smith bought an old World War II Willys Jeep. And he chucked some monstrous V8 in this thing and pre-before the days had paddle tyres on it. He would come through and literally spray the crowd with mud <laughs> and no matter how long they made the track, Clem Smith would just smash it because of this motorsport heritage he had. And, and, and you know, to, to, to think that you and I went to high school and you had such a key role in preserving that piece of South Australian, Australian history. And if, if people who are listening and watching haven't seen the car, Mark will put the footage up. That car we, we we tried to trace some of the history. Remember we had that conversation? Yep. Did you find out anything about that history of that car? Not really. It was the car was or the shell was given to Clem from Mitsubishi or Chrysler in the days. Um, so there wasn't a lot of real history with the shell itself. It was just a shell that was But it's his history with Chrysler. His history, totally. Yeah, that's right. So there were a lot of aluminium panels made for that car. So yeah. they were steel in the day, but- they wanted lighter, so they made aluminium. They pressed aluminium panels for a lot of the cars, so the doors and the guards. And the original car, when it was first built, were all aluminium. And and that vehicle, when it was given to him, Clem obviously had the keys to Manila. Mm -hmm. And Chrysler, the story goes, was that they tested and did the pre-testing for the iconic Australian RT Charger at his track with a VFVG cut-down ute called the Mules. Okay. And the payback was that Clem got a Charger, and it became that one. He also had a genuine RT charge, a very yes. early model one. And Jason and I had a discussion about scratching the paint back and what was underneath. We, we didn't know. You know, was there primer? Was there a colour? Could you trace it? Was there numbers? And I know you looked and I know you tried, but all you found was a, co a thin coat of primer. Was that a right? thin coat of primer, yeah, and other colours that the car raced in. So It could have been a pre-production vehicle. Totally, yeah, totally. You just never know. The provenance of that vehicle is is just outstanding and the reputation of landing yourself on the cover of Street Machine magazine with a green ute, green mm -hmm. ute and backing it up with something like that and all your other achievements. Mate, it, it, it's kind of cool to think we did go to high school and you've done that sort of crazy stuff. It's actually pretty cool. You know? It is. You must be pretty happy with where you are at the moment. Oh, look, totally. I think, you know, it's it's taken a long time. But to finally achieve, not finally achieve, but to achieve what we've done and where we're going with my wife at the helm as well. I yeah, think she's in the business, isn't she? She is, yeah. She she runs front of house, yeah. um, tries to keep me in line. Poor person. <laughs> but, yeah, she does a good job. She does a very good job. Going on the quality of fettling you do with your car, I'm sure she's looked after. Mm. I think the other the other thing I wanted, to, like coming out of the, the talking about the charger too, is um something you've uh, been putting a lot of content on lately in Facebook is um the historic sports sedans. Yeah, right? absolutely. Mm. And I mean that comes around the fact that you've been messing around with a lot of them too. I've got a, a, a good passion for for old historic race cars, which is where the the charger deal sort of came from. So I currently race a LJ Tirana with a uh, mid-mounted Hemi 6 engine in it, big wide-bodied thing, which is cool. And I've had a couple of other old cars that we've bought and started doing work to, and they've been moved on to, you know, further what we own. Um, so we've currently got a, 
A9X hatchback, which was cool. It's been raced since the early 70s mm. and all the way up to sort of early 2000s, which is a really cool car, a lot of good history. Um, we've just sold a VK Commodore. That's another really cool one. Currently, we've got the Pete Gagan Craven Mild Monaro. Which that's is an car iconic car. It's a hugely White important car. White and gold. White and gold. HX? HQ, but with currently HJ yep. panels on it. Went head to head with um, Bob Jane Bob quite Jane. a few times. Yep. And yep. beat him. Yes. Yep. In his Camaro and his Tirana. Yep. Peter Brock with his Tirana at the time. It's a very, very important car, that one. Yeah. And that'll be finished hopefully later this year, early next year. And that's that's another really iconic car that we were lucky enough to, to be able to get the last part of the build on. You're grabbing the right end of the dog, aren't you? You really, you really got the right. It, the right. It's cool. Now, to preserve history is anyone can build a car today to what they want, which is great, but to be able to restore a car that was built 40-plus years ago and to take it back to its prime with parts that are no longer available and you know, replicate the way it was built back then is is difficult. So to be able to do it and preserve it correctly is is, is a good achievement. You're at the forefront of a lot of different influences in the Australian scene and the and the you know the overseas scene. Um, we're, we're starting to close in on the end of the podcast, so we don't have too many questions left. But I want I want to bring one to you, and I'm going to put you right on the spot now. Um, I, I know you've got a creative brain and I know there's all sorts of projects going on, but if you were to put something together to go to Summonats or America or SEMA, something groundbreaking, what would that look like right now to you? This is your no expenses spared, um, the mental ideas in your head coming to fruition. Yeah, well, what, is it, what does it look like? I'd like to see uh, a really high-level electric build, um, but my problem with that is there's no sound. You're going to have this crazy wild car, but no sound. So that really hurts that there. I'd also like to put like a, um, a a late model Euro engine, so like a V12, something really stupid, into an early car, which you don't see a lot of over here. Um, but it'd just have to be something just totally unique, something that hasn't been done before. Maybe, you know, get a Lamborghini and put an electric motor into one of those. Yeah. You know, okay. something current and stupid and put a, you know, a twin Tesla styled front and rear-wheel drive engines into those, so all-wheel drive electric vehicle would be pretty cool. Not bad. Not bad. I've always thought a burnout car tunner with a static engine burnout system on the back, so you've got four tyres doing, but th- but that might brain thing. Like, just a too. smoke machine on the back, <laughs> <it> work? Smoke <laughs> yeah. machine and a fan each tyre? No. Electric vehicle? One at the perfect. bottom, one at the top. <laughs> um, all we need to do is shave your head and you are actually <laughs> Homer Simpson. <laughs> woo <Woo-hoo>, woo <woo-hoo. laughs> <laughs> well, mate, it's been awesome having you come in and talk to us uh, about All and Sundry. And, uh, and I don't think it's going to be the last time we're going to see. I think we'll probably be doing a couple of um, uh, live broadcasts in, in coming time. So we might have to get you back as a special yeah, guest sure. and then help us out with some of those. Any final questions from you, my monobrowed friend? Is Jason an idiot? No. Uh, uh, you're talking to him or me? Which one? <laughs> yeah. Thanks, He's very careful oh, there. Be very, very you, careful there. I'm not going to ask you if you were an idiot. <laughs> No, um, I think uh, moving forward with business and stuff like that, um, like, uh, and this is sort of opening the questions a bit again, but like, I think businesses like yours, um, because it's a, very much an enthusiast and a passionate thing rather than just generic car stuff. Yep. There's the the future's bright because now that cars are older cars are, and and the evolutions keep going, but. Now the older cars are becoming popular and worth more money and people are investing in them because they're cool and not so much restoring, say a HQ or something like that, and people are like, oh, it's not that much money to put an LS in it and that sort of thing. Yeah. That's where businesses like yours are perfect because Correct. people are doing that sort of stuff. And and they even like the electric thing is going to happen and people are going to be driving them every day. The world's still going to have fuel and people are still going to have these passionate enthusiasts sort of um, historic vehicles that they want to drive around in yep. to, to look back at the day. So I think... That's that's where I see your business going, and I mean, um, yeah, we're all until the day we die, we're going to be wanting to, you know, have that sort of thing in our life. We'll probably totally. have electric cars to drive daily, but you know, that's that's what we'll do. But um, and they'll probably be faster than all the LS stuff anyway. <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> but you know, yeah. So I I think looking at what you're doing, it's, it's really cool, and and I mean, the fact that you're doing a service to people by making their lives easier rather than back in the day when people were doing an engine conversion, it was like a that. This is a one-stop shop now, and the advice, the guidance, the products, everything like that, it, it's it's just worth, at the very least, looking at it 
and weighing it up. You are bang on, Mark. You are absolutely bang on. All right, well, that's it. We're going to uh, pull the pin there. Thank you very much for coming in, mate. Didn't get to talk about turbo sigmas, pulsar ET turbos or fast Cortina six cylinders. That's Thank a God. discussion for another day. No, but, but I will throw in a plug for you because a, um, Jason has been very gracious and let me work in my car at his workshop, so big thanks to him for that. It's a cool place. Um, also, yeah, oh, Wanting to talk about all the stuff you saw at Drag Week and all that, I'm pretty sure that if everyone goes to the Tough Mounts page, <laughs> there's going to be about 2,500 photos there <laughs> in Very the short soon. term. Uncle yeah. Jason slide night. As Jason, as Jason gets into his third coffee for the day, yeah. post. I know, I know, I know. Schedule, like, schedule post. Just, yeah. just lot, put it all in a video and just put it up on YouTube it's and away you go. big. <laughs> Thanks for coming, mate. No worries, guys. Thanks all. And we're out. Get in, buckle up, and come for a ride with the Hoonatics. Cars, bikes, and anything else with an engine in it, let's go.